Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Architect attrition. I've worked many sides of the table as an architect, end user, supplier, partner, client advisor, and somewhere in between. And many times I've witnessed architectural attrition. That situation when let's say we have a project meeting and one architect from one organization challenges another or architect from a different organization with their prowess, their knowledge of technology, their ability to solve the problem and offer in their opinion, a better way or better solution that the two architects become like head-butting goats, um, attacking each other head first. It's a glorious display for the onlooker, uh, but it's mutually destructive to the participants and what they're trying to do. So, and like Sun Tzu says, the art in the art of war, let your enemies attack each other until they're weak, and then you can swoop in and win the day. My point is, architectural attrition is bad for us architects, our non-techie foes lie in wait. Welcome everybody to uh, Toolkit Tuesday. Uh, can you believe it's the 14th one of these that we've done today? Um, and uh, great to have you with us today. My thanks to Paul Holman of IBM for the latest in his EA Minutes, a great tip there. And I can certainly resonate with the uh, butting, butting heads, I've seen it many times. Um, smart advice, wait for that to happen and then uh, swoop in when everyone's ready to listen. Um, great advice. Um, as I said, welcome to Toolkit Tuesday. Um, glad you have chosen to spend some of your day with us today. And uh, I hope wherever you are in the world, you are safe and well. And uh, our thoughts right now are obviously with the people of Ukraine. And uh, it, it's uh, we, we just we just hope and pray that uh, that this will be over uh, as soon as um, soon as possible. It's uh, terrible what's going on. But we have uh, to uh, proceed with um, with life and uh, with uh, our toolkit Tuesday. Um, some of you will have be, will be regulars and and know this, so forgive me. But uh, the way that we uh, would like you to ask questions of our speaker today is through the Q and A channel, um, not the chat channel. Um, the Q&A channel, if you can't see it, if you click the three dots uh, in the right bottom right hand corner of your screen, um, you'll see an option to click on Q&A and that's how you should address questions, please. That's uh, the way I will see them. Um, and the chat channel, please chat amongst yourselves. Uh, we love to hear where people are joining us from today. Uh, and uh, anything else that you want to communicate with your fellow attendees um, on this episode. Um, I, I had a quick look at, uh, at, the, at the attendees before coming on and a shout out to uh, Tony Corrado, um, probably there in New Mexico. Good to see you on, Tony. Um, and welcome to, to you and everybody. Let's get going without further ado. Um, our topic today is actionable supply chain security. Actionable being the key word. Um, and uh, I, I, I love things that uh, actually tell us how to how to go about doing things, suggestions for how to do things, um, potential solutions rather than uh, 
rather than just problems. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce my, my colleague, Mr. Andres Sakal, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for the Open Group. Andres is a recognized expert on supply chain security, cloud architecture, and cybersecurity. He's widely recognized as the driving force behind ISO IEC 2243, better known as the Open Trusted Technology Provider Standard, or OTTPS, in the Open Group world. He's also known for his tireless work to establish recognized professional credentials for technology professionals through the creation of the Open Group Open Professions Framework. Andres has achieved professional certifications in security, CSSLP, Solutions Architecture, Distinguished Certified Architect, and Supply Chain Security, Master Certified OTTP. So we're in great hands today. Uh, Andres, welcome, a warm welcome from uh, the Open Group Toolkit Tuesday crew, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Well, Steve, uh, as we know, the pandemic continues to have a significant impact on the global supply chain and now coupled with the unfortunate situation in Europe, we'll, we'll definitely see uh, and experience long-term commodity level disruption now. Uh, my prediction is that these supply chain disruptions will actually result in new partnerships and practices that will refactor the global supply chain. We're going to see a lot of changes. And now we, you know, we know that uh, when supply chain becomes disrupted, it opens up the opportunity for malicious actors and threats. And so our focus today uh, is really, you know, real actionable tips to folks like CISOs, CTOs, and CIOs who are responsible for managing their technology uh, supply chain security. Uh, you know, and these tips are, are based on, yeah, both my experience working to establish guidance and international standards, but also too from a practical point of view as the Open Group's executive responsible for uh, our own internal vendor management, um, you know, both as a consumer and a supplier and uh, our technology security and implementation. So, you know, you're, you're going to hear me talk about risk management and risk frameworks, you know, because this is really a threat-based problem. Uh, you need to understand um, what the threats are. We've talked a lot about this in the past. You can go look it up. Um, but it, you have to have a risk management regime in place and governance in order to actually mitigate these risks. And you can't just simply ask for, you know, the vendor a bunch of questions and expect those to translate into mitigations. Technology is, you know, uh, and those services that support it are sourced glo uh, globally. Uh, that is not going to change in the near term. Uh, for sure, and consumers certainly rely on those suppliers that are operating globally and sourced from the global supply chain. And all of these suppliers and vendors are integrated into our critical infrastructure, government systems, and commercial solutions. And uh, we really under, have to understand those uh, security threats, which are you know maliciously tainted products, counterfeit products, uh, you know those overlapping cyber, cyber threats. Um, you don't want another solar winds, right? Um, and you do need to protect uh, the PII and the IP, uh, you know, and, but these are different protections that you need to put in place, including, you know, protecting against potential in, uh, insider threats and obsolescence and so on and so forth. So uh, learn the risk mitigation elements uh, of this problem. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that folks don't want to say it's complicated, but it is intricate. Let's just say that, right? So uh, supply chain security in the scrim landscape is a little complex to understand and get your arms around. And a lot of organizations seem to be, um, you know, really trying to embrace the idea of, you know, managing uh, a secure supply chain. And that really means managing um, vendors and understanding their approach to secure supply chain. And so this comes from the, um, the QBL guidance, uh, which you can, uh, when you get the presentation materials just and, the, and at the end, you can click into and, uh, and access, but you can also just Google it online. And, and there's lots of guidance out there that should be used. Um, and you shouldn't be coming up with your own stuff so much because uh, the industry needs to kind of come together instead of being disaggregated and, um, uh, necessarily going off and, and, and being one-offs. Um, it, it, it is very uh, 
uh, shall I say, uh, interdependent, uh, depending on how you actually perceive your place in the supply chain. You're a provider, you're a consumer, you're a reseller, you're an integrator. All of these uh, um, different entities are interrelated and you need to understand those relationships in your risk management approach. So how are organizations responding? They're understanding, you know, the scrim standards landscape, you know, what's available out there. They're trying to understand, you know, uh, uh, supply chain security in, in general. Um, they're coming up with their own kind of bespoke implementations in some cases. Uh, they're developing supplier risk management frameworks, which is a really good thing. Um, and they're obtaining industry certifications, which e is even better and certainly an area that we focus on. Um, and then lastly, this, this bespoke custom vendor acquisition surveys is uh, certainly not something that I see quite a bit and uh, an element of tip and risk in and of itself that we'll be talking about as we go on. So vendors are creating kind of their own point of view on what questions to ask uh, suppliers and partners as they go through this process. And that's become a little bit of a challenge for all of us. So uh, some tips for understanding Scrim. It's not the same as cybersecurity. Don't let your cybersecurity folks conflate cybersecurity and, and Scrim. Uh, the two are different, uh, although there is overlap. You know, you have to have security uh, in place to protect some of the assets that in your supply chain uh, landscape. That's absolutely 100% true. Uh, certainly in the development phases, uh, you need to have uh, cybersecurity in place as well. But uh, cybersecurity is not scrim. Uh, and so uh, they're, they're, they're different, uh, but interrelated. Uh, leverage those standards like ISO 20243. Um, there's lots of guidance out here. Uh, this is actually from uh, the uh, CISA qualified bidders list again. And if you notice, they're saying, hey, go out there and use OTTPS ISO 20243 along with all of the other NIST guidance, um, FedRAMP, uh, ISO IC uh, 27000 SOC 2. Um, these are all great resources um, that for understanding supply chain risk and um, and establishing the proper risk management practices. Uh, try and use these things because they've you know we've spent over ten years creating them. Um, look at the uh, and reference the uh, DHS US DHS CISA supply chain security toolkit. There's some similar stuff from the uh, European Union that I've got referenced in the back, but this is actually really good material um, because it helps with both small businesses, large businesses, and they've got a different perspective for each. And we've been uh, participating in the harmonization of these efforts uh, from from the open group. So. Uh, on the task force. So this is something we're very proud of. And um, use a, 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 a framework, a formal framework for risk management like Open Fair. Um, and I see a ton of folks in the federal space here in the US using FAIR. Um, so I know it's being used. Uh, I, I see sometimes the terminology being casted in a new light. Uh, but that's that's okay, you know. It's, what they say is, uh, you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. Um, but you know, look, uh, risk uh, governance and over, over organizational oversight is really kind of goes all the way down to this formal risk management process where you're understanding um, the impact of risk. Um, you're able to identify it and now analyze it uh, quantitatively. Um, evaluate what protections are going to go in place, and then you know put those in, those mitigations out there, and and then monitor the risk. And that's true with um, supply chain security as well. Uh, the other thing is definitely conduct three PAO certification assessments. Um, you know NASA has uh, embraced ISO two hundred two four three, and uh, we have uh, quite a few vendors in the hopper. It continues to grow at a you know really logarithmic pace as uh, vendors try to really understand how to approach uh, supply chain risk management. And um, Seagate and, uh, and others have some really great uh, stories to tell about their journey and how it's helped them. So leverage those. Some of that stuff is already online. Um, and then participate in industry work groups and forums. This is a great way to get um, your 
uh, basic understanding of what some of the challenges are and um, do like I do, facilitate, you know, kind of the, re the reverse feedback. So we're seeing a lot of these vendor scrim surveys. Um, I'd say resist the urge to create surveys from scratch, leverage kind of some of what's been out there and done already. Otherwise, you may be, you know, kind of capturing some of the things that you are personally interested in, but don't really help you mitigate and make decisions uh, um, with respect to suppliers. Um, leverage those existing conformance criteria that are in some of the standards like OTTPS. Um, here's a big one, ask binary questions. Um, do you have a risk management program in place for supply chain? Um, do you protect PII? You know, all of these things, binary questions, yes or no. And um, if the answer is no, you can certainly follow back up with them. These are legally binding surveys in many ways. So you don't have to make this a, a writing exercise. And please, please do not ask open-ended questions where it becomes a creative writing exercise. Um, I, I have no idea what people do when they get that. I mean, are they like weighing it? Hmm, the pros, I love that. The, the, this author really knows what they're talking about, right? No, I, I, I don't think that really helps you at all. Um, it might make you feel better. Uh, you know, it might make you feel like you're, 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 you're kind of putting pain on the vendor, but it doesn't really actually mitigate the risk. And, you know, the other thing is that a lot of us are uh, small to medium businesses, so we don't have the time and the resources to sit around and do that kind of stuff. Um, so the, and, and this has really been recognized by CISA and DHS in the U.S. federal government space, and they've created uh, an SMB point of view on this, and we are sitting, you know, on the task force and the work work groups for having having uh, contributed to this. This is a great set of materials that I would suggest that you leverage. Um, don't please do not ask for confidential in, confidential information or internal documents as proof. No, you may not have them, not now, not ever, and nobody gets those. I've seen this in the companies that I previously worked for, and I've seen this recently. Um, I don't really quite understand why you would ask for a document that is confidential. Um, and one of the things that you know I have seen is, is that a vendor said, no, we have to have this or we're not gonna do business with you. And then fine, what ends up happening is that the lawyers get involved and they uh, uh, define, uh, basically, the the cost back to the the requester in uh, a monetary value, and the saying that if you get hacked and this gets released into the wild, you owe us, owe us a million dollars, right? And then what happens is it comes full circle and it goes back up the chain in the other company. And they're like, yeah, no, we don't really need to do that. So um, you know. Uh, don't ask for system security plans, supply chain security assessments, uh, security assessments of any type, uh, reviews, proof of background checks, which I've seen before too. Um, there, are, there are global laws that all differ in the, in the case of background checks. Just don't ask for that. It's just not useful. Um, you can ask if I, if I actually have one. You can ask if we do background checks. Those are, those are proper questions. Those are part of the templates. And, and make those questions um, actionable, the, the, you know, and, and uh, uh, determines based on data that will lead your organization to a clear decision, please. Um, so some of the tips on standards compliance, because there are some, you know, growing number of standards out there. Don't conflate security and supply chain security. The two are not the same. Cybersecurity and supply chain security are, are not equivalent. Um, you can actually separate them and treat them differently, uh, but you know, supply chain security does have some hooks into cybersecurity. Conduct a, a, an internal assessment with a 3PAO. Uh, this is uh, you know, really de been determined to uh, be invaluable in helping uh, you know, many companies understand what it means to protect the supply chain and what the risks are. Um, it also becomes a forcing function internally for people to actually really do the, the, the risk mitigation piece. Um, use a formal security compliance assessment framework like FAIR, like OFAIR. That's really important um, because if you're just making your own up, you're once again not leveraging what has been quantitatively you know, uh, assessed by um, all sorts of people, academia and uh, industry. And mitigate risk by um, applying compensating controls. You know, the 
that don't apply outside of understanding risk. Uh, I mean, controls don't apply outside of understanding the risk. Um, and uh, technology architecture does matter and it does dictate security control. So you can't ask me if I, if I do all of 853 because the answer is no, because my architecture is such that, you know, I mitigate these risks in these ways. Um, so uh, asking for specific security controls really is the wrong approach again. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this in the past. The Scrim security, uh, the Scrim certification journey is one that is uh, needs to be formally defined in any organization. It starts with uh, kind of reflection, understanding what the standards are, understanding what the uh, conformance criteria is, getting some consulting, doing an assessment, preparing for a third party assessment or a self assessment um, that's done by different folks in your organization. Um, by or, or organizing the material and evaluating um, your level of compliance and what needs to change um, programmatically from a business process point of view. Um, and then, you know, properly applying the scope and support um, as you execute over a period of time. And, you know, look, uh, shameless plug for ISO 20243. You know, these are really valuable documents and um, certifications that can help you overcome uh, some of these challenges um, as we move forward in the global supply chain. And, you know, uh, if you want to, and I would invite you to, uh, here's a place to learn, engage, and adopt, uh, you know, additionally um, from the Open Group perspective. I promise some resources. Um, uh, these are all out there and uh, easily Googleable, uh, uh, searchable, um, all the way down from uh, the uh, CISA ICT supply chain risk management toolkit uh, to the um, INSA uh, EU uh, understanding the risk of supply chain security and their attacks, and the UK supply chain security guidance. All really good materials, all really kind of very based on the same thing. They all end up in the same meetings, been there with them. Um, lastly, the one that I really want to point out is that um, we need to grow our professionalism in this, and uh, I would really invite folks to become open CTTT, CTTP certified professionals. Uh, and um, and that's it, Steve. That those are the tips, and I I, I guarantee you uh, that if uh, folks were actually able to um, uh, you know internalize some of these tips. It would certainly make my job easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I was I was actually going to come to that in the first question that's come in, but uh, thank you, Andres, for uh, for that uh, whistle stop tour and uh, and some practical tips on the on the topic. Um, so, as you, as you said um, uh, at the beginning, this this comes from not just the work you've done in the in the industry, but from um, implementing our approach to um, supply chain security and cyber security here at uh, here at the Open Group. So, is there anything that you've you've particularly learnt um, in the latter case here of trying to um, you know trying to implement our policies and respond to the the kind of surveys that you get from from some of our uh, customers and suppliers? Yeah, um, it's been an interesting last year and a half, and I say you know interesting because I get to kind of change the role from you know. Uh, being a CTO in a large company and participating from the technology, you know, manufacturing point of view to uh, being a supplier again, but from a different point of view, but also to, um, and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be the person who is building out our technology implementation and, and is responsible for the suppliers. And, um, Supplier management is a full-time kind of job for most folks. I mean, you know, in the uh, CIO, CTO organization, because, you know, there's uh, those, those folks are so intertwined with your implementation. So, yeah, it's coming directly from our experience with managing our suppliers and receiving copious number of, um, of vendor surveys that are now, you know, necessary to conduct business with, with our membership, with our, you know, folks that are, are using our services. And we're getting to see firsthand just how many different companies, you know, uh, may ask the same question and in some ways, uh, in, in different ways. Um, 
And in some cases, the wrong questions are even asked for confidential IP that um, really shouldn't, you know, will not help them in, in our assessment um, in reality and puts them kind of in a risky position that where if they were to lose control of those assets, that could be a problem for them and us at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, so, some of these, uh, some of these questions that come in, it's a, I, I know it's uh, it's a question of uh, having to have the right boxes checked, and um, you know, and when they're not, then you get the kind of reaction or the kind of response that you that you referred to was, okay, well, we're not going to do business with you now. That can that that would be kind of scary, particularly for a smaller organization, for example, that you know can't afford to lose a customer like that, but at the same time doesn't want to disclose. Um, confidential details and things that it shouldn't have to disclose. So, um, you know, you mentioned getting getting lawyers involved there. Is there, you know, have, is there a, any suggest to, uh, to maybe a, a smaller organization without the, the resources to bring in the, the big legal guns? Um, so I, I do think putting a price tag on those assets if they're lost is important. Um, right. Look, at the end of the day, I'm going to be very transparent here and say that I have never actually been in a situation in a large company or a small company where the company asking for this information um, has decided not to do business with us. Um, it just doesn't happen, right? Uh, and I've, I've had it happen to me as well where I'm asking for certain information that seems to cross the line of that vendor and uh, and and I don't get it, but I can always ask, you know, binary questions. I can always ask for meetings where I can ask pointed questions and I can always put T's and C's into contracts uh, that uh, put penalties in place in the case of uh, a, a cyber supply chain event uh, that is my uh, my responsibility, right? or their responsibility in, in that case. Um, so yeah, there's some, definitely some things you can do that, that don't require you to actually take the risk of getting you know, all sorts of other um, sensitive IP from your suppliers or vendors. Oh, that's that's uh, good advice, thanks. So let's make it more, uh, nearly nearly out of time, but let's make it more, um, more, more general. You talked about some of the um, standards and you know, best practices standards and certifications. What are the kind of most significant challenges that you see organizations face in trying to adopt those? Uh, expertise. Right. Yeah, it really comes down to expertise. This is a, a new science. And, um, you know, most people haven't spent the last 15 years of their life uh, working on, you know, uh, guidance and standards. So I would say look to, you know, CISA, look to INSA, look to the UK supply chain uh, team, look to the open group, learn from the conformance criteria that's defined in standards like ISO 20243. Um, and, um, you know, look, uh, because of lack of organiz organizational expertise, you know, it really becomes difficult to properly articulate and defend an organization's selections and application of controls. So you have to build your expertise because if you don't, th then you really have no way of applying a risk management framework and you have no way of putting the right mitigations in place and you have no way really of understanding the implications of uh, why you're asking these questions in these vendor acquisition uh, surveys. Right. right. Yeah, no, absolutely. So to anyone, to anyone either um, attending this live now or watching it later, there's uh, that's in either already practicing this field or interested in this field, there's, there's an opportunity there. There's a, from what you're saying, there's a shortage of expertise there are certifications available there's a there's a really real opportunity to become one of the experts so that's right uh, that's great to great to hear andres thank, thank you very much we've got to leave it there to uh, respect people's time including yours so uh, thank you for joining us and and sharing your uh, insights um a question came in yes this this presentation um will be made available um, and if you're registered, which you clearly are, if you're uh, attending this, then uh, you'll be notified when that's available and you can uh, go and watch it all over again. 
Um, and those of you who registered and weren't able to make it, um, then uh, you'll get the chance to see it. So thanks once again, Andres. Um, thank you. And thank you to everyone to join us. Don't go just yet. Just a quick, uh, a quick plug for our next Toolkit Tuesday, which will be in two weeks' time, March 22nd. Uh, we will be cycling back a little um, on some of the, we've had a lot of topics over the last 14 episodes and we have questions coming in and we try and keep these things to, a, to as close to 30 minutes as we can. We don't always get the chance to go through and answer the questions um, that get asked. So we're going to cycle back on some of those questions and uh, getting answers from the people that, that uh, presented at the time, either live or they'll they'll supply us with those answers. So join us in two weeks. We may even see some of those people back. We'll do our best to go through those uh, go through those questions. And if you have questions for today and you didn't get a chance to ask to ask, then, um, you know, we let, let us know or we'll join then and we might be able to uh, get those answered, too. So thank you for joining us. Uh, be safe and well wherever you are. And uh, Join us next time, two weeks, March 22nd. Thank you for joining Toolkit Tuesday. Bye for now.